Mm -hmm. It's interesting in the association world, dues for most associations make up only 20 to 25% of the revenue that comes in the door. So I know every association has members that say, oh, it's just, I don't know, it's too much. It's, it isn't nearly enough. It's never going to be nearly enough. And so we, we always have to find other ways to make up the difference to offer that value. But increasing dues shouldn't be an issue as long as you can increase the value with it. Put that coffee down. I'm not here to waste your time, okay? I certainly hope you're not here to waste mine. So I'm gonna keep this short. Helen, we're both in sales. Let me tell you why I suck as a salesman. The most valuable commodity I know of is information. Wouldn't you agree? Coffee's for closers only. Well, hello there, friend. Welcome back to the Behind Your Back podcast with me, Bradley Hartman, founder and CEO of the Behind Your Back sales company, where it's our mission to help you sell more, faster, at higher margins, and have more fun doing it. As for this podcast, we talk about leadership, personal productivity, time management, and the craft of selling in the construction industry. This episode is brought to you by our friends at Capital One Trade Credit. If you, perchance, are interested in selling more, increasing cash flow, decreasing risk, and leveraging technology to make it easier for you to grow your business, make it easier for people to buy from you, you want to check out Capital One Trade Credit. How do you do that? You can just Google Capital One Trade Credit. I'm excited to bring to you today my conversation with one Rita Ferris. She is the president of the Northeastern Retail Lumber Association. Also known as the NRLA, Rita has been there for more than 25 years and has a lot of experience delivering unique value to her members. Now, who are her members? Well, the NRLA offers the staff for 14 individual state lumber and building material associations. That's right, 14. So among the things that we talk about is listening well, collaboration, building trust, and delivering unique value over a wide area and a very diverse set of customers. So this was a fascinating conversation, and she brought a lot of value to me and a lot of insights. Now, Rita graduated from Russell Sage College in Albany, New York. Now, here's a pop quiz. What is the mascot for Russell Sage College? Answer, the Gators. That's right, the Gators, which led me to type in, into Google, to confirm what I believed. Can alligators survive in upstate New York? And the answer quickly confirmed what I thought. No. It would kill them immediately. The cold weather, them being cold-blooded. I mean, what's going on? Now, I don't want to derail this entire podcast over this, but uh, I do believe it's my responsibility to point out the incongruity between the Russell Sage College Gators that absolutely are not living anywhere near this college. Anyway, after graduating from Russell Sage College, she started working for the New York State Legislature. And that is where she saw the power of influence and how laws get built and the importance of just a small singular voice, let alone a small group of passionate individuals who want to tell their story to enact change. And that is one of the things that we talk about here in this conversation. We also talk about how NRLA is leading associations across the country in online learning. We talk about listening and leadership skills, and we talk about some of the successes the NRLA has had in terms of workforce development, all things that you are going to enjoy listening to. My friends, as always, thank you for listening. Please enjoy my conversation with Ms. Rita Ferris, president of the Northeastern Retail Lumber Association. So, Miss Rita Ferris, welcome to the show. Thank you for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. Well, I'm excited to have you on the show for a couple of reasons, but one of them is whenever we have a guest who performs really well and we think really highly of, we will ask them, hey, who else in your network do you think would be a really good guest? And I would say over the last... Oh, six to nine months or so, your name has come up 
at least a half dozen times. So then it became a scheduling thing on our end to try to reach out and connect with you. So I'm thrilled you made time for this. I think you're just in a really unique situation. I think maybe the first question I have is, you know, flashback to March of 20 and the several months that followed where our world got turned upside down and we work with a lot of associations across the country and many of them you could see really struggled with adapting, kind of changing from the old model to continue to add value in a way that they maybe haven't had to ever or nearly as much. I think you guys have done such a great job of that. Take me back to that time and how were you guys able to really adapt so quickly to provide value in such kind of a unique, you know, at least in a a century, some unprecedented times with the pandemic? Wow. (laughs) The start of the pandemic, what a nightmare. It was uh, absolutely terrifying. We had never been in a situation like that before. Certainly nobody had been. And, you know, the doors were closed instantly and nobody knew what the future was going to look like. So basically what the association did was we fell back on what we always fall back on, which is bringing people together to come up with solutions to help the industry. And so we instantly reached out to the membership, reached out to our state and locals, and we figured what do we need to do to get back on our feet to keep the doors open? And right away, we knew at the state level, each governor was going to have to decide if our industry was essential or not. So we went to work in every one of the states, in all 14 states, and was able to get essential status for the members. Some of the most rewarding work we've ever done for the membership, which was fantastic. But the other great part of that was we didn't just do it in our own association I worked with other association executives, retail lumber executives, and we put our heads together and we we came up with a plan together. And, you know, it was really nice to have that executive to executive support too while we were working through this challenge. We brought in industry experts like Ruth Kelly Grubbs to say, all right, this is a time of emergency. What should you be doing right now? She gave really strong guidance on what to do at the time and it was reacting quickly, you know, just not leaving the members hanging out there wondering what the future was going to be. We told them, this is what we're working on. And then we delivered. So understanding the NRLA encompasses 14 different associations. You've been doing this a long time, more than 25 years. What have you learned over your time about leading such a diverse group? They are diverse. It's funny that you said that because each association really has its own culture and they're kind of like personalities, right? But despite that, between them all, they really have the same wants and needs. So it comes down to the same thing everywhere in business and the association world. And that's listening to your members, listening, what are the pain points, listening to the 14 associations, what are you struggling with? and then delivering solutions to that. You you can't fail if you're continually communicating with them. We have a very nice, unique partnership too. Those 14 associations are independent. They have their own board of directors, their own treasury. They pick their own education, their legislative priorities, and they run 120 events a year. But what they don't have is their own staff. So we are the people that support them in that way. And it's so cool how it happens because every single thing that we do is subsidized by member dues or income that we can earn in other ways, right? Because we try to give high value for the least amount of money. But then the 14 associations come in and they partner with us on it. So if we're offering education for $100, they come and they say, well, we want our members to get it for $50 and we're going to take that money out of our treasury and subsidize them further. So we're just constantly partnering to maximize value. And they do that on the legislative front. They do it for the convention. Basically everything we do, we partner together on. I wonder if I could dig into that a little bit, because I think on the surface, you'd say for, for you to be involved in this line of work and to serve in this way for this long listening has to be a core component. 
But it's also one of those things where I think that's what people say. Like, oh, you got to be a good listener. And, and yet we meet people every day who are like, I don't understand. It doesn't seem like you're listening. So I wonder if we can maybe drill down just a little bit. Are there some structural ways that you make sure you are consistently listening online, offline? Obviously, the pandemic has probably created some challenges in terms of maybe being together in close proximity or maybe not. We found ways to navigate around that. I think you're in such a unique spot where I'm thinking of you and having, again, such a diverse group of people that you need to listen to. Obviously, I think you've probably had some earned insights that we could learn from. So what are some of the ways that you guys find and you strive to make sure we're always listening and our ears are always open? I love that question. We have a very high touch model of communicating with our state and local boards and with the membership. First of all, all of the boards, they serve on the NRLA board. So everything we do, they know is for them. And that's one way we communicate. But in addition to that, we, our staff, we want our state and locals and our membership to know every person on our staff. Like everyone's accessible. We encourage them to be reaching out all the time. We have four people that work in the field. They're at every single event, every single board meeting. They have two jobs. One is to support the state and locals. Their other is to visit every member at least once a year. So between talking to the membership one-on-one and talking to the boards all the time, you know, they report to our internal staff every week, at least once a week, if not more. So it's just nonstop communicating in writing, verbally, the regional directors, when they visit a member, they then talk to the board about what are the members saying in their territory? What are the members saying they need? So they help the locals be successful and then they help NRLA be successful because we're here to basically serve the locals and the membership. And let me ask you a question. Maybe I misunderstood this. So you have four people. They are in the field constantly. Their job is to visit every member of each one of the 14 different associations? Yes. Every retail member. Okay. Yes. That to me seems like it would be mathematically impossible, but obviously they're doing what you're talking about. They are, their job is to constantly meet people, see their operations and listen. It's very challenging to get to everyone. Time is always an issue for sure. Especially now that the members are so busy, it's been tougher to get in the door, but They do want to talk to us because we have things to offer them that are valuable. So we're doing more virtual meetings now as well, which is definitely a fallout from COVID, but a positive one. Yeah. I wonder if you can go into that a little bit more because I'm familiar with a little bit of what you guys are really doing with online learning and you can fact check me here, but it seems like you're really expanding your list of educational offerings online. Maybe share what you're doing when it comes to online learning. So that was a positive thing that came out of COVID. Believe it or not, we had a lot more positives come out of it than we ever expected. We were obviously forced to switch gears to have live online learning during COVID. We were fortunate in that we had already been building a platform and making plans to do this. And we were prepared when it happened. It just came together at the right time, if I'm being perfectly honest. But the live learning education has been incredible. We've had record-breaking support from the members for all of the classes. They've been selling out like crazy. And we've doubled the amount of education that we're offering. And they're still selling out. So we don't need as much lead time when we're doing these classes live and virtually. When you do a class like locally, like on the ground, you, you waste time. You're like looking for facilities. Then you're putting out all this marketing material. When you do it live and virtually, you can just turn that stuff around so much faster so we can be more reactive and offer more relevant education because we can move quicker. Some of the classes that we're offering are just basic essentials like blueprint reading, sales training. But whereas someone would have to go away for like a full week for sales training, we'll take that training and we'll break it down over six weeks and offer two hour increments of the training to make it way more easy on the business and not take people off the job for the full day. We're teaching our members how to increase engagement when their staff is working virtually. We're doing yard layout and operations, how to maximize 
the yard layout. And we're doing those in six classes over two hours. So everything, we're just taking, taking it and breaking it down into smaller bites so people can use it much more easily. We have a learning management system that's not live as well. And that's also been used more than in the past. What's cool about that is for free, our members can have their staff take a skills assessment test. And then it shows where they need to strengthen their education. And then we can put together a customized curriculum for them. But if the student or the employer doesn't have time to manage that, we'll even do that for them because we know they all have good intentions, but can't always follow through on managing those details. Wow. Well, I was going to ask you with this volume of collaboration with folks who are presenting my own experience of being a learner online is I found taking some courses and folks have found a really good way to leverage technology to make it interactive and draw people in and do the virtual breakout groups. And then we'll also have other ones where you realize about 15 minutes in, like the next 45 minutes is going to feel like five hours. Yes. What have you guys learned or how have you been able to help? I don't want to say vet, but uh, help make sure the people that were presenting there, they're really going to deliver high degree of professionalism and value because there's so many people that are in person and live are really good. It's, I can tell you someone who does this, it's a totally different thing. And we've really had to kind of rack our brains, but how do we adapt and how do we become better? Because Yes, it's going to be different virtually, but there shouldn't be 50% less engagement or enjoyment or laughter, but it's a, it's a unique combination. So I'm curious maybe what's what you've learned from working with so many folks that way. We were so lucky to hire the education director that we have okay. because she used to work for a publishing company that puts together co- education for colleges, right? So interactive textbooks and live learning, education. So she knows what to look for. Some of it she had to help our instructors with like, hey, make sure you make a list of every student and engage every one of them on these important topics. But a lot of them we had seen ahead of time, most of them we had seen ahead of time. And we're able to have those conversations about, all right, these are the things that are different if you don't have experience in this area and and help them be prepared. So it's partnering, you know, helping each other be successful. So this will be our uh, asking for a friend segment readout where I ask you a question about something I'm personally involved in. Asking for a friend. I recently joined a board of an association I've been in for a long time and uh, really value them. It it has been my opinion, which I've voiced over the couple of years, that they are not charging nearly enough for the value they provide, which is in a way is very much saying, I want to pay more dues. And I've since joined the board and have, because of course I've been on the board for like 24 hours. I ask if I could do a pricing study about the dues that, you know, maybe we should rethink it as based on this limited amount of information that I've given you. What advice might you have for some board member who comes in, engagement is high, maybe common sense is low, tough to say. And I said, hey, Rita, I want to do an evaluation, just kind of look, because I think we're providing a lot more value than we're getting in revenue. And one of the goals is to increase revenue to the board. What sort of advice or questions might you offer this theoretical individual that is asking you? Board. Usually board members are kind of shy in the beginning. They, you know, a little concerned about stepping out. I, I, and what a great value that you were offering to do that. I think I would ask questions about what's the big picture. You know, it's interesting in the association world, dues for most associations make up only 20 to 25% of the revenue that comes in the door. So I know every association has members that say, oh, it's just, I don't know, it's too much. It isn't nearly enough. It's never going to be nearly enough. And so we, we always have to find other ways to make up the difference to offer that value. But increasing dues shouldn't be an issue as long as you can increase the value with it. And so those are the questions that I would have is, okay, well, what else are we going to be able to offer? Because I don't think members mind investing in themselves if you're going to be saying to them, well, 
if we increase the dues, now we can help you with workforce development or some issue that's really breaking their back. Yeah, absolutely. And that's that's where I think part of this thing, and I'm not going to take this too far, is the the value menu of offerings that they have. In some cases, it's so large that so many of these things the members aren't aware of. And in some cases, just bringing it to light, they're like, oh my gosh, I would gladly pay more for that. I didn't realize that was here. I've been a member for three years. So I think to your point, kind of that sales 101 is if you're delivering value, you know, commensurate, obviously, but if not 2X, 3X, 10X, theoretically to what their investment is, people will gladly pay for that. So it's good advice. You mentioned workforce development, and that's something that uh, I certainly wanted to get to because I think you guys are so far down the path and nationally in just in every part of association, every part of the country, every part of our construction industry, workforce development is a huge issue. Maybe take this anywhere you want to take it, Rita, but what have you guys done to really get traction around workforce development for your members? Yeah, workforce development is either number one or number two top priority for the association. Right now, we're working on that issue literally six different ways. Three ways, we're being proactive about it. And three other ways, we're trying to help our members to maintain the employees that they have. Okay. So on the proactive front, we're working to put together a marketing campaign to tell the public the story of who our industry is, to emphasize the variety of employment opportunities that we have, while also telling them about the values of our industry, because people don't want jobs anymore. They want something that has value and meaning in their life. And and we have so much of that to offer. So that's going to be a multi-pronged campaign. It'll be print, social media, video that can be used in a ton of different ways. And again, that'll be a partnership with our state and local associations. So we'll create all of the big pieces and then we'll work with them to figure out, well, where are we going to place them? You know, if they want to do things locally, while NRLA does that on a broader scale, we're going to partner to be successful on that. We're also working at the state and federal legislative level. We have a few pieces of legislation introduced at the federal level to help give our members, not just our members, but people in our industry funding for training their employees. So giving them new skills, essentially, and letting them decide, letting employers decide what skills they need to be successful, and then saying they need this education, and then being partially reimbursed for for that, for growing the workforce. And then we're also working with dealers locally. We do a lot of job fairs. We have, you know, our annual trade show. We have a big industry recruitment event where we bring in schools from all over the Northeast. We introduce them to retailers and to the associate members. So those are the three proactive ways. And then the other three ways to help maintain staff. We just introduced a new telehealth program. I know that sounds like it's a step away, but it's not. This telehealth program is a very inexpensive way to add a benefit to the staff that are currently working and their families. And it offers like virtual health care, virtual mental health care, chiropractic care, nutrition. So, and again, it's not just for the employee, it's for their family. And what a way to say to your staff, I'm thinking about your family as well as you, you know, and we want to support you. So it's like $10 a month per employee to get that help, that health care. I mean, it's just phenomenal. It saves employers money and employees money too, because, you know, we all have these high deductible plans now and they don't have to spend as much. We're doing a comp and benefit survey now so that our members will know where they need to be with salaries and benefits. And we're offering a ton of education to help new employees be successful on the job because this is the tricky thing. Everyone's so short-staffed. The training piece sometimes gets missed. And then you end up losing an employee. The quit rate in our industry, not the retail lumber industry, in the retail trade industry in general is 4%, which is like the second or third highest of any other industry. So we're, we're bleeding people and we're, we're already shorthanded. 
So we have to do everything we can to maintain the ones that we have. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. This this thoughtful onboarding. What's the first day? What's the first week? 30 days, 60, 90, just to get people going. Because on one hand, you're so thankful to have this person. You've been needing more talent. And then they get here and too often it's, they just bounce around like bumper cars for a while, don't have a whole lot of direction. And then oftentimes, right, everyone else is going 100 miles an hour. They reach some point, which is generally in just a handful of weeks. And they're like, this isn't fun. You know, my boss hasn't talked to me. I don't know. This isn't great. And I don't know. I talked to a buddy and I can get a job somewhere else making 50 cents more. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. That that onboarding and letting them know that, hey, it's not going to be perfect. It never is. We've got a plan for you. And here's what we need from you. Yeah. Here's what you can expect from us. And how do we do this together? It's it's such a such a challenge. You get it back tenfold. It, it's hard to do. I know it's hard to slow down and take someone by the hand to make them feel successful, but it's so worth the investment. Yeah, I want to change directions here a little bit as I'm watching the time, Rita. I know you've had a lot of success and your background is in public policy and getting overall engagement around something that historically for me, and I'm guilty of this being on boards and being members and being like, eh, of all the things you're talking about me get involved in, this one's probably going to be at the end of the list, but it's getting involved in legislation. And yet, I know I'm preaching to the choir here, that can be some of the most important work that is done to make it easier for us to run our businesses successfully. So maybe just talk about some ways that you've been successful getting more people, young and old, you know, tenured and newbies into our industry, getting them involved in persuading and influencing legislation. I am so passionate about legislation. And the reason why is because I used to be you. I used to be the person who didn't care about politics, who didn't want to know about politics. I mean, it's embarrassing. I didn't know who my assembly person was or the difference between what they and a senator did or any of that stuff. And I fell into it. I was in school and a friend of mine said, did you sign up for the intern program? And I said, no. And he's like, well, you're a poli sci major. You're going to need this credit. So why don't you do it? And I ended up getting an internship in the New York State Assembly. And I thought it'd be back in a heartbeat. I just, I just choke it down, get it over and be done with it. Well, I got in there. I had the best boss who took the time and exposed me to so many wonderful things I know people are going to shake their heads and they're going to say, I call BS on this, but I got to see people working together to accomplish great things for the public. My first job there was constituent services. People would call, you know, if the electricity was shut off and you needed to help them with the utilities, I would help them with that. Then I started working with committees and I got to see and learn about, well, how are these bills drafted? What really goes into negotiating? And you know, why would we do this? That was exciting. So it was, it was really all about helping people, right? That's what associations do. So that was like crack for me. I mean, I just couldn't get enough of it. So I ended up working in the legislature for four years. I got recruited out of there to work for the New York State Realtors Association. They're a very powerful association. At the time, they had 60,000 members in New York. Our legislative committee was 200 people wow. and you had to like be elected to be on the committee. They had so many people that wanted to do this. They actually had runoffs for positions, which was <laughs> hard to fathom given the way the environment is today. But the long story short is, again, I just gained more experience helping people and reaching out to people who didn't know the process. And because I was that person I, every time I meet someone who says they don't like politics or don't understand, they're my target. I am like you. My personal goal is to be by your side in Washington while you're lobbying. And I'm going to teach you how. We're, gonna, we're never going to let you fail. That's the key. You're going to be prepared. You're going to talk about what you know. We're not asking you to quote laws or a chapter and verse of some technical thing you're not comfortable with. You're going to talk about the industry. You're going to talk about your day, what gets in your way, and the how and why they should help you. 
And once we get to that part, because that's the part I can't do, only the members can do that. They get in there, they have a taste of success, and then they're they're hooked too. Well, you also said uh, something that I remembered, and uh, I thought, well, this is an, this is an insight to the obvious. But I said, you know, I've talked to some of your members who are they're twenty somethings, and they've been involved for a while on the legislation front. And uh, I said, well, I can imagine being understanding how power works and how influence works. I think that's interesting. But otherwise, it looks really boring. And you said, yeah, well, we don't make it boring. We make it a lot of fun. And I said, well, hold yeah, on. Me Getting close to power and having some fun, that's the sort of thing I might be into. How do you guys do that? How do you make it fun? Well, we mix business with pleasure always, right? So if we have a lobby event, we always have like a great dinner. We'll take tours of, in Washington. You know, we don't just make it all work. But we also put a face on the legislative process. We'll bring in speakers and then we'll say to them, we want to hear about what's going on. We want the inside ball. We, we also want to know about you. What makes you tick so we can connect with you? Like, you know, you're a person just like we are. And then people leave there feeling like they're more familiar. You know, they're, they're that much more comfortable. I mean, at the end of the day, legislators work for us, right? Like I work for the retail lumber members. So they, they want to hear what's on our minds and they want us to help them be successful. So we, we don't only, only ask what they can do for us. We also say, well, how can we help you? Tell us where you need us. We'll be there. Yeah. No, that's well said. I think that goes to, you know, just a lot of the fundamentals about helping people, which in my mind, always is very close to, to selling and to determine your value. Sometimes it's the discovery process of asking questions and probing about people more often than not are very willing to tell you where things are making it harder for them to run a profitable business. And if you can listen well and try to find some unique ways to help them, they're going to be all in. So that makes sense. Bradley, did you know that less than 1% of the population will take the time to lobby? Do you know how unique that is? Like if you want to be a leader, you really, you really want to be impactful. People have this impression that they're lost in a sea of voices. It's not as big as you think. So when you step up and stand out like that, it really does make a difference. I think that's really important because on one hand, when you tell me like 1%, I'm like, yeah, no, that, that feels about right. However, flip that on its head. If you want to be the 1% and be a leader that gets recognized, it's a pretty shallow field for you to go in and get involved and stand out. So yeah, I think that's, that, I'm glad you, I'm glad you mentioned that because I think that's really important. So let me ask you this, uh, kind of a last question here. I'm a book nerd and I'm always looking to talk to different folks and I'll kind of set this up in one of two ways for you. When you look back and kind of your career, your leadership career and management career, was there one book that maybe stands out in your mind that was more influential or take this a different way? Is there a book you've read recently that you said, Hey, this really had an outsized impact for you recently over the last couple of years? The book that I'm reading now, and I'm trying to remember the name of it, it's Kevin Hancock's book. And it's about his work with the Native American people and where they are in today's world and why they are where they are and how, because of their values, because of a promise that was made to them, it's so difficult for them to change. I just find that fascinating. It makes me think about the people that I serve, to probe deeper, to ask better questions. Don't just assume and take things on its face because this issue that he's working on is just way more complex. I find it inspiring that he has had such a massive impact on the Native Americans that he's not Native American himself. And so you think, you know, I'm an outsider, what could I do? But yet, he was just a very open, honest person who was willing to listen and learn. And he is making tremendous impact there and, and bringing our industry into that, something that we wouldn't naturally be involved in if it weren't for Kevin. So it's amazing. It is. And actually, I'm looking around here. Somewhere behind me, I have two books that he's written. And the most recent one uh, was on kind of culture. Uh, the one was him about going and spending so much time in the Dakotas and learning about the history. 
I'm yes. thrilled you brought that up because insight into that history, which I was largely ignorant of, kind of sent me down Same. this path <laughs> where I started reading more. And I read a book, it's called Empire of the Summer Moon, which is largely about the Comanches in kind of Texas and Oklahoma, but also in that area, they kind of bumped up against the Lakotas uh, and some, but totally fascinating. And I feel like I don't know, whatever U.S. history courses I took through grade school and high school and college never touched on any of this. And to your point, I have I have Kevin Hancock who kind of sent me down that that rabbit hole. But And that's why I love asking the question because I think if you can stay curious and be open up to new things, there's a whole world out there of things, uh, A, that we're unaware of, but also B, of things that we can impact. And you're right, his story about getting involved and building and all that. It, it's fascinating. And I'll make sure we kind of include that in the show notes for folks to uh, invest in his books and also understand that story. Oh, that'd be awesome. Yeah. The shared leadership book will be the next one on my list. It's not like I only read Kevin's stuff, but I mean, <laughs> I it was just so good. You know, I'm looking forward to the next one. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I, it'd be interesting at some point down the line, I've talked to so many folks, maybe I think part of it is kind of, you have this demographic shift where we do have a lot of really talented, experienced folks who've been in the industry for a long time, who have a lot of wisdom. And I've talked to a lot of folks who've said, you know, kind of somewhere I do, I'm a little bit curious about, about writing a book and they've been inspired about what Kevin has done. And I said, well, Hey, scratch that itch because we're going to lose an entire generation of a ton of talent. Every day we have more talented folks that are leaving I'm like, I don't care if you, you have a couple beers and you get a microphone like I've got here and record it. I don't care if you write it down. I don't care if you record a video, find some way to leave some of that knowledge because I mean, we've already seen it with some of our clients where we're like, Oh God, Bill, Bill was here for 39 years. He's been gone for six months. And every day we say, Oh gosh, Bill would be the person for this. And, um, so anyway, I, I think I, I hope, and I believe there are a lot more folks that are thinking about, Hey, Maybe it's only a 50 or 75 or a hundred page book. Could I do that and leave a legacy? And I'm excited to see where that goes in the next few years too. I'm glad that you're inspiring people to do that. You know, you're hitting the nail on the head about the loss of knowledge that we're mm -hmm. going to be facing and are facing. Yeah, absolutely. Well, we only touched a fraction of the stuff. And I think again, with your exposure to these 14 different state associations, Again, I've, I've been lucky enough to kind of partner with on kind of single engagements or multiple engagements with different associations. And I've been really impressed with what you guys continue to do. But I also know some of our clients are members of your organization and they kind of say, actually, we got this idea or we started doing this once the, the NRLA led the way and showed us how to do it. And I think anytime people can look to an association that we were afraid of this or we didn't know how to do it. And the association kind of led us to there. I mean, that's immense value. So uh, congratulations on all your success. And uh, I look forward to a round two somewhere down the line, hopefully in person when I make it up there in the Northeast. Oh, I'd love to see you. That would be fantastic. And it's a, it's a pleasure to be here. Thank you for having me. All right. Thanks, Rita. You're welcome. All right, friends, how did that go? Hopefully you enjoyed my conversation with Miss Rita Ferris. Now, our goal here is to make this the best podcast you listen to. So I'd love to hear your thoughts, ideas for future shows, any potential guests, or any sales fundamentals issues that you're struggling with. Do not hesitate to email me directly at bradley at behindyourbacksales.com. Again, bradley at behindyourbacksales.com. You can also link up with me on LinkedIn and connect with me on Instagram at behindyourbackceo. And if you did find this episode valuable, please share it with your network and leave a review. People look up to you as a leader. They look for you to guide them on what things are worth listening to. And if you thought this was valuable, that would mean a ton to us if you shared this with your network. And again, thank you to our sponsor, Capital One Trade Credit. If you, my friends, are interested in increasing cash flow, driving new sales while decreasing risk and leveraging an incredibly advanced digital platform to make it easier for you to run your business and for your customers to buy from you, you will want to check out Capital One Trade Credit. Now, my friends, that's all I've got for you today. We're going to close out like we always do. You, my friend, you are owed nothing. Deliver 
I'll you first. Make it a great week. 